Hi everyone. Uh, I'm Rudra Roge, part of the Contrail team. And today I'm here to present a uh, couple of new things that we've introduced in the Open Contrail solution. The first one is service chaining version 2. Uh, it's a new way to do physical, virtual, and container-based services. And just the concept of container networking, we are working on Kubernetes, Mesos, and any other solutions, and how to plug in Open Contrail in all those solutions. So to begin with, I'll just give a recap of what Open Contrail solution looks like. We have a Contrail controller uh, in HA mode, wherein we run our config node, so we serve REST APIs, as well as complete BGB-based control mechanism to manage a set of compute nodes. So here you can see that we have a couple of uh, hypervisors. That could, this could be Linux hypervisors or ESX as a compute. Any of those hypervisors we currently support. We have a kernel module, which is the V router, and that runs on all the hypervisors, which are controlled by the Contrail controller. You could have any of the different orchestrators, OpenStack being one of them. Uh, we also, in the Open Contrail solution, support managing or interfacing with actual gateways. The gateways could come from any third party vendor, networking vendors. So you could plug in. You could plug in your compute node and actually go out to the internet directly through the gateway, uh, unlike many other solutions where you would need a software gateway in the middle. So there's no single point of failure in terms of a software gateway here. Uh, there's two levels, which is the common framework for anything in, in the overlay world. You have the physical infrastructure, and then we have the complete overlay networking. Here in this example, Everything that we create has a concept of fundamental concept of virtual network. So think of various virtual networks. And in Open Contrail, you can only connect them through network policies. So the basic advantage is that within the network, any of the VMs can talk to each other. In the example here being uh, you have a green virtual network, a blue virtual network, and a yellow network. They can talk to all the VMs within the network and talk to each other. But as you want to go from one network to another network, you need to connect them using a policy. Now that policy is kind of different than security groups, where you instantiate the security group on a particular VM. In case of policy, you apply that to a full virtual network. So it's automatically inherited to any VM that is launched in that virtual network. By default, everybody in the green network can talk to each other. But when they want to go to blue, we have a policy saying only HTTP traffic can go through. And that policy would trigger in for everything. The important concept that I'm going to continue on is the service chaining. So if you notice, there's the blue network and the yellow network. We have forced by policy that any traffic between the blue and yellow network has to go through a firewall. In this case, could be any other service. And it's a pluggable module, so it could be any third party virtual service, whether it's physical, virtual, or container based. So essentially, here we have uh, a VSRX, a virtual SRX that is sitting between. And ensure you can apply firewall rules on that VSRX itself. Uh, the improvements that we have done in V2, but before I, I jump on to V2, which we've just released, I wanted to talk about V1. In V1, when you instantiate a virtual instance, Open Contrail would go ahead and manage the life cycle of the virtual machine. So if you have a firewall, a load balancer VM, or any other VM which offers some kind of service, the Open Contrail service would actually launch the VM, in fact, scale out the VMs based on you know, your need for uh, throughput is higher. So in that case, we would be the bottleneck in some sense in various ways. One thing, if you have many Nova attributes, such as availability zones, uh, forced host, or even cloud init scripts that you want to pass on to the VM, we wouldn't be able to do that that easily. We would always have to catch up to the orchestrator solutions. Uh, the second thing was we could not leverage so much happening in the OpenStack community in terms of heat. So we, we have kind of introduced a new concept called service chaining v2. So as opposed to managing a VM, what we are doing is now managing ports. So abstracting this one level away from a virtual machine to ports gives us 
in fact, gives users a massive advantage because now you're abstracting the ports from whether it's attached to a virtual machine, whether it's attached to a container, be it port, or whether it's attached to a physical appliance. In all cases, there is a concept of logical port that exists. And if you create a port tuple, is the term that we're using as part of V2, and use that port tuple to create your service. So if I'm saying virtual network one to virtual network two, always goes through this port tuple. Now what that port tuple is attached to is another level, level of abstraction. And that gives us tremendous advantage of leveraging everything that the VM orchestrator actually offers. So in, the, in case of Nova, you can pass Cloud and scripts or anything else that Nova can do. Similarly, since the user is actually responsible for launching the VMs, you could use heat templates to launch the VM. And that gives you things like um, basically uh, scaling out. So heat has this automatic scaling based on feedback from Celometer. If you have high, if the throughput is going low, CPU utilization is high, heat would actually auto scale the VMs as in launch many instances of that particular service. So your firewall could automatic, automatically scale out based on Celometer analytics feedback. And so those are the kind of advantages that you have by binding to a port as opposed to actually managing the life cycle of the VM. Now heat is in effect managing the life cycle of the VM. Uh, we have a few other advantages here in terms of what we are offering is you can launch services in active active mode so the traffic is actually distributed. Uh, open Contrail being a full L3 overlay has a notion of ECMP by default in every vRouter. So you're automatically distributing and spraying traffic across a scaled out model. Um, it also has active standby. We use something called route preference and uh, uh, allowed address pairs, a combination of those things to actually do active standby of traffic. So you can go through one service chain, and if that fails, then we actually move on to the other. And to do that, we actually have a concept of service health check. So this is an interesting concept because as you're going creating these multiple chains, what happens in that case is if one of the services, one of the firewall instances is not working fine, traffic stops going through, but you're not able to detect that because the VM is still up and running that offers the service. So in that case, we have a health check that you can configure to actually go ping, do a URL get to see if the service is actually up. And if not, then we bring it down, we bring the route preference down, and the other chain would go active. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to talk about other than V2 was what we are, the work that we are doing with Kubernetes and with Mesos. Uh, I'll focus, I only have a few minutes, so I'll just focus on Kubernetes uh, today. Uh, so as you're aware, uh, Kubernetes is the Google open source orchestration and has a concept of services, pods, containers, labels. Uh, it offers a flat networking architecture today. There are, of, of course, various solutions trying to solve that, and Open Control is one of them. Uh, so whenever you're launching a pod, there's fundamental concept of defining a pod. And pod has a name, and it offers DNS-based service to an outside entity and how to use that pod. Uh, there's a concept of labels that we use to associate all the Kubernetes concepts into Contrail concepts. So whenever you have a tag as network tag, we create a virtual network out of it. Whenever we have a network access tag, so let's say you have a service Redis and it's offering network access for another entity, we would create a, a front-end entity and Redis a network policy. As I mentioned earlier, everything in Contrail is through network policies. So you create two virtual networks for each of the pods slash services, and then we automatically use the tag to create a policy between the pods. So what you notice here is fundamentally you moved away from a flat structure to a completely policy-driven, isolated structure. These pods cannot talk to each other by default. They can only go through if the policy is enabled and connecting the two. Uh, this is an example of how typically you would do a pod definition, and the tags would help you to communicate with each other. So what we've had to do is we've added a listener. It's called the Cube Network Manager, and that's a plugin which listens to the Cube API server, and any messages that go on, 
we listen to those messages and we convert them to uh, open contrail specific messages and program our forwarding engine. So whether it's a new network that needs to be created whenever you launch a new service or pod, or whenever you want to connect to pods, all the translation happens by the Cube Network Manager. This runs on the master. All the contrail uh, controller demons are containerized, in fact. So if the config node, the analytics node, uh, the controller, everything has been containerized to run in this environment. Uh, on all the minions, which means all the compute nodes of uh, Kubernetes, we also run a kubelet. We replace the kernel module, which handles uh, Docker networking or uh, Linux bridge. We replace that with our vRouter. So again, it's an L3 overlay with open contrail. Uh, the vEth, whenever a pod comes up, the vEth is plugged into uh, our vRouter. So our vRouter is fully aware that a new container has come up. And it then talks to the controller, exchanges all the information in terms of IPAM or anything that we need to do. So fundamentally, the solution is we also provide ECMP to services within Open Contrail. But overall benefits are you're providing multi-tenancy uh, solution in networking. Uh, there's complete isolation of tenant and pod traffic, as I mentioned earlier. And overlay in Open Contrail uh, is through the network policy mechanism that we have. And it's a seamless integration between private and public clouds also. We've set up uh, two Kubernetes clusters to talk through uh, two MX gateways across data centers, as well as you can actually go from your data center to Amazon and back through this mechanism. With that, uh, I wanted to mention that all the security features that we have in our service chaining, uh, Sushant is going to cover that in terms of CSRX and VSRX offerings. Thank you, Rudra. Uh, my name is Sushant. I'm the product manager for the data center security uh, in the Juniper Network team. Uh, I'm going to share a couple of very interesting announcements that we made uh, this, uh, in this summit. So the first one is about the 100 gig VSRX. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with VSRX, let me give you a brief overview. So what we have is the industry's fastest virtual firewall. We do 17 gig. Uh, large packet or 4 gig iMix with only two vCPUs and 4 gig of memory. We use DPDK internally, and then um, we, run, we have integrated with OpenStack. We have a uh, plugin and driver that's uh, available for free. So what we did uh, is with two vCPUs, we are able to achieve 17 gig. So we added more vCPUs to the single instance, and we saw that the performance was scaling linearly. And with just 12, vCPUs, we were able to hit 100 gig large packet throughput. Another thing I want to stress here is the host that we are using for this particular test is a two socket uh, Intel Xeon uh, host machine. Each socket had 12 cores. So essentially, we were just using one socket to achieve this 100 gig performance, and the entire second socket is free to run other workloads or other VNFs on the same host. In terms of performance comparison with the existing VSRX and the new VSRX, so as we added more vCPUs, the performance scaled linearly. And not only did the basic firewall throughput increase, but even the advanced services fire, uh, throughput has gone five to six times. So one particular thing that I want to stress upon is the IPsec performance. So with single instance, now we are able to do a four gig throughput. The main use cases for such 100 gig firewall is uh, if someone is virtualizing uh, uh, CG firewall, then the main requirement there is having carrier grade NAT and high performance firewall. And with 100 gig VSRX, we think we have a good use case there. Moving to the other uh, announcement that we have made is the CSRX. So what we have done is we have taken all the features that we support on the VSRX and we moved them into a container. And this is what we are calling as container-based SRX. So it's a firewall built in a container. This is the industry's first container-based firewall. 
Um, it has complete security feature parity with the VSRX. It doesn't have routing features, but the security features are all there. Um, the code base is singly sourced from the VSRX code base. So uh, essentially what it means is any fixes that go into the physical SRX uh, get applied into the virtual SRX as well as the container SRX. And we retain the same management, uh, pl management layer uh, with the virtual firewall. So if you have built automation or uh, tools around uh, physical firewall, you can repurpose them to use virtual firewall as well as the container-based SRX. In terms of value proposition, so the main value proposition is the elasticity. Because there is no static reservation, like in case of a VM, um, the, you can provision more instances on a single host, and the resource consumption grows as the traffic to it uh, increases. And then it adds greater agility to the environment. The boot up and restart times are under one second. So, um, this adds to the agility to the customer environments. And then it also adds to the cost savings uh, for the deployment because the customer is no longer required to choose one monolithic application. They can choose the services they require and only deploy them. Also, you should see that uh, the container is only using resources for the services it's actually uh, running at that point of time. So the resource consumption is uh, restricted to the services that are enabled on that container, which also uh, converts into cost savings for the customer deployments. Uh, we have a uh, brief comparison between the VSRX and CSRX. So VSRX supports complete routing and firewalling features. Uh, in terms of CSRX, it is uh, doing the security services. Uh, and then in terms of CPU requirements, VSRX requires two vCPUs uh, statically reserved for it, while uh, CSRX would, would take up CPU, CPU and memory resources as, it actually, um, as the traffic to it grows. So when there is no traffic in an idle scenario, the memory consumption is about uh, 40 to 50 meg. And even in terms of the image size, uh, you can see that the CSRX image is only 150 MB, so it's very easy to download, deploy, and get started in your environment. I'll talk about a couple of use cases where we think that CSRX has a uh, play. So the first use case is the Cloud CP use case. In this use case, the managed security service providers would want to provide uh, security services to a large subscriber base. So the requirement there is to instantiate a virtual security instance for each of their subscribers. And when the subscriber base is as large as, let's say, tens of thousands of them, uh, the resource requirements to actually provision so many virtual instances is very high. And because uh, VSRX consumes less resources, and the individual throughput requirement of each of those subscribers is not high, you can now uh, provision a lot more subscribers on a single host. And so this converts to cost savings and the uh, uh, OPEX savings for the operator. Even in the UCP use case, where uh, some of the VNFs are running on the customer deployments, the, the system requirements on the UCP box are also very low because of the low resource requirements by the CSRX. And one thing I want to stress in this scenario, uh, Juniper can provide end-to-end -end solution in that Contrail can do the service orchestration and CSRX or the VSRX here can be providing the security services. And the second use case I want to talk about is the micro-segmentation. Um, we have a demo of this at our booth uh, where we can talk in more detail, but the idea here is um, the security groups within the open stack can only provide limited, uh, limited security options. So to, to provide advanced security to the VM workloads, we can actually provision a CSRX against each VM workload. And the traffic to the workload and to outside of that workload will actually go through the CSRX. And the user could go to the Horizon uh, UI and apply the security group rules, and those will convert into policies that get applied on the CSRX. So you would actually be able to apply these security policies 
at the VM workload level instead of on a network level or uh, on a subnet level. Right? Again, uh, we have the integration with OpenStack, and the demo is at the booth. Uh, we can also do this with Contrail, where the, the QBR now becomes the V router within the Contrail environment. Like I said, um, if with the CSRX, if anyone is interested in beta, please do reach out. Uh, if you have other use cases where you think that CSRX would be, be fit better, do reach out to us. And if you have use cases for the 100 gig VSRX, please do reach out to us. And please do stop by at our booth to look at the demo for the CSRX and the VSRX that we have. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Did I?